evening with Ashley. So welcome to tonight's episode. Um, I saw a bunch of you saying that you were going to have a drink and pull up a chair. So I hope that that's happening <laughs> because we're going to be talking lady parts tonight. So I'll give you guys a second to check in and then we'll take questions. I want to explain a little bit about how muscles and fascia work um, and then we can kind of talk about all the different issues that we all face on the downstairs. Okay, so um, tell me who's checking in. We got Mendy, Don, Connie, Lana, Tammy, Jeanette, Ophelia, I love Crystal. Ophelia. Ophelia always is on there. She's great. Totally. We got, we got our regulars. All right. Angel just checked in. Gail. Okay, so I'm just doing a little sketching here. Um, we're just going to talk about muscles in general. Okay. And everybody is going to be getting their myofascial education tonight. <laughs> okay. So this goes for any muscle. So what we have going on is usually you have the tendinous part, which people call tendons, but it's still kind of part of the muscle. Then we have the belly of the muscle, and then it goes on to the other tendinous part. And usually what it does is attaches to, you know, a joint over here and a joint on the other side. Then every single muscle is layered with fascia. So there is somewhat of a clean model here for the structural fascia. So those of you who've read my book, you've seen this. Um, we think of it, you know, like an orange where the white part, you know, separates out the little pieces. But in the human body, it's not quite as neat as compartments. You might have a line of fascia that comes up the quad and then dips inside and becomes, you know, something deeper and then it comes back up and back down. So it's not quite as neat as this, but for the purposes of this talk, we'll just simplify it and say that we have a coating of fascia in between all the muscles and it separates the muscles. Um, then we have all through here attached to this, we have all of the interstructural fascia like that. We always get cat bombed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he knows. Okay, so we have structure, structural fascia in between the muscles, and then we have interstructural fascia inside the muscles, okay? Everybody with me so far? Throw up a thumbs up if you got it. Got it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm kind of having to go off on colors here, but aside from muscles and fascia and fascia running in between. Remember that we have blood, so the black is gonna be the blood, and it goes to the skin, okay? So we have blood inside the fascia, and then we also have the pink, which is gonna be the nerves, okay? So pink is nerves. All right, so it looks a little crazy, but all I want you to know is that we have muscles, they're coated in fascia, and they're penetrated by fascia. We've talked in the other evenings with Ashley's about muscle activation through the nerves, okay? So the way that a muscle contracts is that the brain sends the signal through the nerve, and then you create pump, or additional vasodilation, ooh, big words tonight, um, with the blood, okay? And that's actually how we condition and grow muscles is the blood comes in and forces the cell to grow, okay? So that goes for your bicep or for anything else. So let me just get a check-in. Is everybody good? They get where we're at right now? Yes, Lauren says yes, teacher. <laughs> okay, good. All right, now, we're gonna talk about the poo nanny, all right? <laughs> so now, I think that we feel like it's this completely separate part of our body when really it's all made up of muscle and fascia. So when you guys go to study anatomy on this, like if you were just to Google it right now, 
Um, anytime that you see the word sheath or membrane or connective tissue or arachnoid matter, all of those are just medical code words for fascia, okay? So any picture that you pull up and you hear those words, it may not say fascia, it may say like perennial sheath or something like that. The sheath part means that it's fascia, okay? So I'm gonna show you on the Essential Anatomy 5 app, we're gonna zoom in here and what I wanna show you is how much all of this is just muscles, okay? Come on down here. Sorry, Cindy, it's normally on Thursday, but tonight only it's Wednesday. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we're looking at some deep glute rotators. Then we're bringing in some more of like your uh, vaginal area. And then we've gone the full Monty, okay? So when you think about downstairs, I just want you to think of it as muscles. And then we can add the nerves. Look at how many of the nerves come down there. And look at where the nerves come from. They're shooting out of the spine, coming out of the sacrum. So interesting, right? Look at this. This is a male, okay? He has a penis. I saw the nerves. We don't have that. Your nerves don't hang out of your vagina like that. <laughs> okay, and then we also have the blood, those are your veins and arteries, okay? So when we talk about sexual pain, the same way that you can have a painful, tight piriformis, or the same way you can have a compartment syndrome in your calf, you can have spasm in the muscle where the fascia and the muscle fibers begin to clamp down. And because our vaginal wall is made up of muscle and fascia, I was gonna show you a picture of that too, um, then you can have the exact same issues in your vagina that you have anywhere else in your body. Not to mention just the picture I showed you, if you saw there were so many attachments on the pelvis, and the pelvis is basically two halves. So if something gets tight on one side, it can you know, pull the pubis into a weird position and pinch a nerve. Like there's just so many things that could go wrong because the pelvis is so complicated. Um, and I just showed you the muscle. I didn't even show you how the fascia comes in from all different vectors in the body. So this part of the body in general, including the core, because you've got your organs and your visceral fascia, there's just a lot of things that could go wrong. And sometimes we just end up with the spasm being, you know, in the area that causes us the sexual pain. So, this is kind of like the side view of our vaginal wall. So this is your urethra and your bladder. And then this is the vaginal canal and the uterus. And this is obviously the intestines and the anus. But everything in between and all around here is muscles and fascia. Let's see if, we, if they have a code word for fascia. I pulled this out because I thought this was interesting. They said, it's a point of conversion, I typed in vaginal wall muscles. It's a point of conversion of various structures, the superficial and deep transverse perineous muscles, <laughs> all these, okay, hold on. So what I wanted to get to, first of all, I think levator ani is a funny m m uh, name because levator is like, levator scapula, it means it lifts and it will pull up the ani. So when you pinch your booty, it's your levator ani muscle. But what I wanted to show you was this. Um, look, the perennial membrane. So if you guys see the word membrane, what did I just tell you? Membrane is fascia. Fascia, sheath, connective tissue, membrane, okay? And then they talk about the muscularis. So we're talking about a whole, whole lot of muscles and fascia that make up that entire pubic region, okay? So let's just run through a few common topics and talk about how to treat it. Um, I wanted to get to one more thing. We can take a question while I figure out where this is. Oh, no, I found it, okay. So, um, one of the things that was so incredible about doing research at ASPI is that we were able to get ultrasound imaging. And I've been trying to post this a lot because we posted it a few times and I just don't think people latched onto it. But let me show you something that's so cool. And we can just even look, this is just, 
the baseline in day 30, and I'll blow this up a little bit. So all I care, we're, we're looking at a leg, okay? But what I want you to see is all of this trashy fascia, and in 30 days, it's smoothed out. And in 60 days, it's smoothed out even more. So just because we're not palpating, you know, there's no way we can palpate all the way down to our femur bone, which is here on the ultrasound, the fascia starts to kind of take over and restore itself. So you don't have to physically reach it, is what I'm saying, in order to impact the fascia all the way down to the deepest parts of the body. Because I know if I were watching the live feed, I was like, I'd be thinking, is she telling us to blast inside of our vaginas? And I am not. I'm telling you that if you blast around it on the peripheral layer, that you can actually impact the fascia deeper, okay? So I feel like we should do another check-in and just make sure everybody's with us, right? Mm -hmm. We're made up of muscles, so we're made up of fascia, we've got nerves flowing through here, we've got the blood going to everything, it's all intertwined within the bones, and then we know that if we palpate at the surface level, that we can impact the fascia throughout the depths. So did we get that? Can I get some duns? Check, check, got it, got it. Lots of, lots of thumbs up and hearts. Okay, awesome. Also, they're saying you look fab. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Inga told me, she's like, oh, what are you doing, Britney Spears, tonight? I guess I am dressed a little younger than a 46-year-old should be. <laughs> <laughs> but this was actually my look today. You're good. All right, so let's talk about some of the things that I see on the page. So first of all, with skin, okay? So I'm literally talking about our labial skin, okay? So if you're wanting to tighten your skin, you would do it the exact same way you would do anywhere else on your skin. And the reason that it works is number one, systemically we found out in the study that we're increasing a collagen production. So that's gonna be a longer term effect, but we're also flushing blood to the area, which carries a lot of nutrients that's gonna deliver to the skin what it needs to actually tighten, okay? So without being too graphic, if you're gonna actually blast the outside of your um, vagina, you would want to use the face blaster and literally straddle you know, one lip and then straddle the other. And I definitely still like using the face blaster for the inner thighs, all along the pubis, and then of course in the lower abdominal region. You could use the master blaster, you could use the mini one, but the claws of the face blaster and the master blaster are gonna be better for that area just because it's so small, okay? So skin tightening, yes it can happen, have actually, you know, sometimes we don't post everything you guys send, but we definitely have had inboxes about this. So that's the skin tightening. Um, we talked a little bit about um, sexual pain coming from the muscle or myofascial spasms. Um, we talked a little bit about pubis pain when the bones get out of alignment. Um, I want to talk briefly about incontinence because prior to the ultrasound imaging, I was just kind of like, is that a placebo thing? But if you think about the bladder, which we showed, um, if, if you're having issues with the fascia and the, the bladder not being totally intact and leaking, and you're able to restore that fascia, then it makes perfect sense to me as to why you could have a result with incontinence issues. So we haven't specifically studied that, but putting the pieces of the puzzle together, I definitely think that's something we can be really hopeful um, about in terms of helping with incontinence by blasting basically the inner thighs, you know, the hip flexors, all along the belly area, you know, the tight uh, inside of the buttocks and down the sacral area. So if that's happening, if the spatial restoration is happening from the surface to the deep, then there's no reason why we can't be able to help with incontinence or you know vaginal spasm or anything else. Mamba had a really good question. She was saying, what causes incontinence? For some, leakage happens if they jump or sneeze. Is it because the muscles are weakened or the fascia is restricting flow? I think, you know, I was about to say, let me go talk about the pelvic floor a little bit. So I think that there's multiple reasons. I think number one, your bladder is encased in fascia. So if that fascia is disrupted, um, then you can have issues with the actual bladder. But when we talk about the pelvic floor, 
Let me get back to those muscles. You know, we, you don't want your bladder or your uterus or anything really sitting and pushing down on the pelvic floor and have a weak pelvic floor um, when that's something that's super easy to fix. Um, in fact, we are gonna talk about it right now. This is super cool. Denise says, oh my God, I just realized I don't have the stress in conscience like I used to. And Robin Lala says, it works, I can attest. Yes, girls. All right, so let's look at the pelvic floor, okay? So if anybody's ever seen my ICVDs, I talk about the pelvic floor as part of contracting your core unit, okay? So let's talk about the, you don't need to know the individual names of the muscles, but basically the pelvic floor starts at the pubis and kind of goes underneath your bottom like a, a hammock or a sling. And you can um, strengthen it by doing a Kegel exercise, which is just like a pinch. But where I, I don't wanna say that I differ, but where I really take that to another level is that when I'm doing, I don't care if it's a bicep curl, I'm all about contracting the transverse abs, which is more like the draw in or the <laughs> cough muscle. If you can contract the transverse abs and the pelvic floor, then you do your scapular depressors, then you do your bicep curl, then not only are you strengthening the pelvic floor, but you're telling your brain that every time you go to pick something up, that that firing pattern is part of that human movement. So incorporating the pelvic floor with every single exercise that you do, or just walking around with the transverse abs, scapular depressors, and pelvic floor on, over time, you give your body that muscle memory and you're constantly conditioning the pelvic floor. So if you have the hammock, if you will, lifted up and strong, then your bladder or anything else is not going to push down on it. So did that make sense? Yes. I feel like it did. <laughs> Lauren says, so Already we should have two face blasters, one for upstairs and one for downstairs, <laughs> and we need another color face blaster. <laughs> <laughs> We're coming out with the pink ones, or maybe we just make it the glitter. <laughs> <laughs> the party blasters. <laughs> <laughs> the badge blaster. Oh my God, that's going to end up being a hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really true. I mean, you guys know we always talk about making sure that you, you know, clean your blasters, and obviously if you're going to be blasting your face and blasting downstairs you want to make sure you have a good uh, cleaning routine for that yes. questions you guys are always asking it now I'm willing to put myself out there you got I'm gonna scroll up to the top we got a lot I of actually questions. found a group that says shit Ashley black says so I'm sure that I'm gonna get on the highlight reel tonight <laughs> <laughs> yes let's do it <laughs> let's do it you edit that for me I'll put it on my own page <laughs> I think it's one of those things that women tend to, you know, have some shame around. Um, early in my career, when I was teaching the ice DVDs, I was working with physical therapists at a big, huge um, women's hospital, and that was the first time that I realized that, like, yeah, this is really an issue. And I, I just think of it like, imagine you guys, if men had to have babies and they were ripped open, or just imagine if it was a shoulder that had had a baby you know we would have that thing stitched up perfectly we'd have mesh there would be all kinds of you know training involved there'd be massage and everybody would be all over it but when you're a woman and you have a baby they're just like thank you and have a nice day so I think it's really important that we go back and go okay this I'm talking specifically to the moms you know like first of all if you had a vaginal birth you know these muscles have been stretched beyond capacity so has the fascia um, and then, of course, if you've had C-sections, then all of that has been cut. And there's a big restoration process to that, not only for the scar tissue, but, you know, when you walk around all the time during your pregnancy, you know, pulling on your low back, losing access to the lower abdominal muscles, losing access to the pelvic floor muscles, it just makes perfect sense how things can go awry. And I just, I don't think of it like the vagina, I think of it like a shoulder. It's the same problem. It's just been completely destroyed. Same thing with, like, massive weight gain and massive weight loss. You know, you're stretching things out and they're not going back together and there's gonna be a fascia component, a muscle component, a strength component, a neuromotor component, an alignment component. And so that's how I would tackle all of these issues. Nice. Joy said up above, I tried to pull the skin above my JJ and belly pouch and it was very tight. Should we be pulling and blasting this area too? Sure, absolutely. 
I want you to think of it, you know, not as like the no-no area. It's just like any other muscles and fascia. So any of the techniques, like I really, if you're really sensitive, because I know people have told me like I can't even touch my pubis, then refer to the live feed when I was in Santa Monica and I was doing the disarming techniques. Because you can use disarming techniques on your vagina too. I think I even showed in the one last week in Turks and Caicos where I pull on the C-section scar, and I take the um, I take the face blaster and I go right along my pubis, and then I even take the nugget and I do the poke and wiggle, wiggle all along the pubis. Nice. Gail says, "How often should we use the face blaster for skin tightening?" I mean, I think it's just like anything else. We say two to five minutes per area, you know, three to five times a week. Cool. Rachel says... And never do it when you're sore. Yes. Rachel says, could numbness be a fascia slash nerve factor too? Yes, of course. So let's talk about that. So just picture the nerves here, right? So the nerves are coming through in pink. What color did I make fascia? So the fascia is the blue. So if you have a fascial adhesion, Anywhere in there that clamps off the nerve, it can either make it go numb. Nerves do two things. They either make you make you go numb or they kind of buzz you all the time. Like you have that tingly or burning sensation. That's always a nerve that feels like that. Nice. I also wanted to talk about um, orgasms. <laughs> the big O. Because I was actually reading up on it today because... You know, I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. I haven't lectured on this in a really, really long time. But I mean, basically the general consensus is that we don't really know where orgasms come from other than our central nervous system and our thoughts when we get aroused. But what physically happens is that the nerves begin to get sensitive and then the blood flushes to the area and then it flushes all around and to the point that you know, you're so vasodilated that you need a release and you have an orgasm. So again, going back to what we said about nerves, if you have blood being cut off or muscles that are, you know, all in spasm through here, you know, oh, this, these fibers aren't working, you're going to disrupt the ability to get the blood and nerves going, which is going to disrupt your ability to have an orgasm. And at the very least, if we get strong pelvic floors, and we get all of this working where we have the blood and the nerves and the muscles working, then we should have stronger, better orgasms and also better control over that. Yes. I get an amen. <laughs> Linda says, what kind of oil should I use for the downstairs? You can still use the blaster oil. You know, I mean, I think what you have to realize is when you're downstairs that there's a chance that some of the oil could go in. So just make sure that it's something that, you know, is not toxic. Karen says, how many times a day should we do Kegels? Stress incontinence issue. I mean, I think Kegels is something that you could do anytime. I think of it like when I give the diastasis, you know, protocol, do a hundred a day. But I also want to stress that Kegels, what I was telling you with firing it as a motor unit, I don't think it should just be like, oh, here's my whole day. And then over here, I do my Kegels. Your kegels should be part of your activity. So like if you're sitting at your desk, just do a little contraction and pull up your pelvic floor and contract it, you know, throughout the day or like when you're walking or if you are, you know, lifting weights or doing some sort of exercise, make it a mental challenge to contract the transverse abs and the pelvic floor at the same time because then it becomes part of your neuromotor pattern. So I have a question. Are we doing Kegels while we work out? Yeah. Like when you lift, you tighten your abs. And yes, you do and Kegels. you pull the pelvic floor up. So what it feels so like, so that. transverse abs feels like this, and pelvic floor feels like this. So if you do it at the same time, it feels like this. And then if you add scapular depressors, it feels like this. And then squat. <laughs> and then <laughs> bicep curl. Uh-oh. Totally. To a whole other level. Totally trying that right now. <laughs> I... With the ice DVDs and, and, you know, I've always really focused on core strength and pelvic floor strength. And um, one of my clients told me one time, she was like, yeah, I can pick up peas. And I was like, what did she say? <laughs> All right. And she was saying literally she could squat down and pick up peas. So that's what we want. We want to have strong enough vaginal walls that we are able to pick up peas. <laughs> pick up blasters? No. 
Dahlia says, I know you're talking about tightening that area, but what if tightness is an issue? Not sure if anyone else has this issue. Well, if you're over tight, then that means that you've got muscle and fascial spasm. And even though that's kind of counterintuitive to think that one person would do it to loosen and one would do it to tighten, it's really the same process because you're just restoring. Nice. Dom says, does a jammed hip impact those muscles? Just discovered that oh, I have a jammed Lord, hip and realizing yes. it's likely the cause of low back pain I've had for years. Yes. Okay. True that. So also, if you guys are not watching evenings with Ashley, you're getting kicked out of the group because we've mm -hmm. been doing some really awesome stuff and have talked extensively about um, jammed hips. So if somebody can post that live feed, I did a whole protocol of how to um, address the jammed hip. But what I want you to look at is how close your hip is. You know, basically it's inserting into the pelvis. So if you're having any type of pelvic pain, it could be something that's happening through here, but look, boom, hip, okay? So if the hip, let me do it without this. If the hip is impacted, the pelvis knows this. And so the pelvis will rise or rotate or do whatever it can to get out of the way of that impacted hip. So if you start messing with that pelvis and getting rotation or elevation or impactness or tight SI, you're setting off that chain reaction to get those muscle spasms. So somebody may have a jammed hip and feel it in their low back because that's where their pelvis went was to jam, jam their lumbar spine. Or somebody may have an impacted hip that actually shifts something in the pubis and they experience pelvic pain. Same problem, different symptom. Nice. And one more question. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Get a, a good a one. one then. What we'll do, just so you know, I know this is a really hot topic with everybody and I think probably the hamster wheels are going. So tag somebody if you know that they experienced this and what we'll do is later tonight after I've had dinner and everything, I will go back and answer everyone's questions. And I know the motivators and moderators are also there to help. I know we have several good videos about how to blast for incontinence and really the incontinence protocols that Julie Chilberg did are great for any of these issues. Awesome. Rachel says, huge part is pain in the, I'm not sure I'm saying this right, pudendal nerve. Mm -hmm. Talk about this, Ashley. The pudendal nerve, all right. Let me see if I can find it. Girl, you are challenging my anatomy. Karen calls it the yum yum zone. <laughs> I think when she's saying the pudendal, we're talking about the puboral nerve and they all, even if it goes, like the, basically what I'm saying is there's a big branch and little branches, but we're talking about the ones that come right through here. And I mean, I think that th it goes just like any other nerve. You know, the nerves are running through the muscles and if you get a spasm, then you're going to experience pain where that nerve is sending a signal or it's going to either be numb or it's going to be kind of buzzing at you. Nice. Make sure I answered that question right. I know we said one more question, but this is important. Joy says, <sighs> do vibrators hurt anything down there? Am I doing damage to the nerves? I don't think so. I actually think it, if you knew me personally, you would know that I'm a highly sexual person. and. I think that it's very, very normal for us to orgasm. I think that's something that probably we should do a lot more. I think it's like eating, exercising, like it's part of our body's way of expressing joy. And so I think stimulating, whether it's, you know, clitoral or vaginal, as long as, you know, you're not using something too big that's, you know, doing damage, but certainly on the outside, you know, I think of it like a, a coochie workout. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, so everyone's asking how to get stronger pelvic floor muscles. I think that needs to be part two of evening with Ashley. Yeah, I think that does. And it's something that I really want to go in and explain, um, because it, I can't stress enough that it's not just about squeezing. I mean, if you go ask any OBGYN or any doctor, any physical therapist, if you say, how do I strengthen my pelvic floor? They're going to say kegels which is where you literally try to draw your sits bones closer together and up. And if you can't even do that at all, you know, I've seen women that have had to use EMG machines to get those things on, but it does take some practice doing those Kegel muscles, but mixing that with your other activities is super important. So if you guys want that, you know, we do a poll every week. I'm more than happy to take you through um, Kegel exercises and, you know, tell you where to feel so that you know that you're doing it. And then we can also do some examples of ways to incorporate it with um, your other exercises. I love 
incorporating pelvic floor with inner thigh. And you guys know I just filmed the fascia mechanics and I talk about that when we're doing the inner thigh, like contracting the transverse abs, the pelvic floor, and the inner thigh all as a unit. It's very, very powerful. All right, ladies. I hope you enjoyed that. You know, I don't think this should be an off the wall subject that we're scared to talk about it. I'm certainly not. And I definitely think that this is something that is, should be part of our life, our, our vaginal health, our, our pelvic health. And, you know, just this whole center of gravity is, is so important to just our life as a human being. So I appreciate you listening. I hope that it absorbs. I know we went over a lot of information, but again, we're always here. You can inbox me anytime. Um, and I promise I'll go work the thread later this evening and make sure that everybody got their questions answered. So join us, Member Monday. It's been going awesome. We have met some amazing people. Thank you so much for those of you who have introduced your friends and family to the group. We love it. It's awesome. They're fun. But I, you can tell they're into it. Um, and then you'll see me next Thursday night. We're going to go back to 730 Central on Thursday. And then everybody just cross your fingers and wish me luck because on Saturday, don't know what time, I am going to be doing my first TED Talk. And... The title of it is How Cellulite Saved My Life. <laughs> and I can't perform it for you because it has to be debuted for TED, but the minute that they let me release it, you can bet that you guys will be the first to hear it. So anyway, have an awesome hump day and happy vag day. <laughs> <laughs>